Welcome to the Wildverse podcast, where we introduce you to the wild world of taxidermy, a place where artists and hunters collide. I'm Ashley. And I'm Heather. And today we're going to talk about taxidermy in pop culture. From serial killers in real life to movies and TV shows, we taxidermists have it rough. Yeah, I know. Tell me about it. So like the first time that my sister-in-law ever came into my shop, she was expecting eyeballs and fetuses and glass jars just sitting all over the place. So she was really surprised. But, you know, where she got that was a thanks to Criminal Minds. Uh, Speaking of that Criminal Minds episode, I actually watched it this morning before we recorded today. And so if anyone's wondering, it's season five, episode six. It's called The Eyes Have It. And a little backstory on that episode. The killer in that episode is a taxidermist. And his thing is that when he kill somebody he takes the eyes out of his victims and puts them in his taxidermy mounts and we all know that that would just not work like that as taxidermists we know (laughs) they need to be either glass eyes or acrylic eyes something like that but something funny about that episode of course it took place in oklahoma city they were trying to paint the picture of this guy as like some redneck weirdo hunter (laughs) weird taxidermy dude of course they chose oklahoma but and then also uh, something kind of interesting about that episode, which is I find it kind of funny, maybe not funny, haha. But the reason this uh, killer in that episode started his killing spree was because so obviously the guy was a taxidermist and he had a customer come in to pick up his bobcat and the customer was unhappy. He said, the eyes don't look right. You don't do eyes good. I'm taking this to somebody else. He was so unhappy about how the eyes looked that this taxidermist got so upset. He killed the customer. And then he put the customer's eyes in the bobcat mount. So (laughs) it was... Well, we've all had one of those customers. (laughs) That was the kind of like funny part about it, but it was also like, you know, it's super morbid. Yeah. And they just... That episode, they paint taxidermists in such a poor light. Oh, but- yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, we're going to have to put a little clip or, like, picture. Um, so I got a picture of that bobcat with the human yeah, eyes in it. You and did. I've, I'm sure it looked a lot better with actual bobcat eyes. <laughs> it looked really weird. But we'll have to put a little thing in here. Like, the whole shop, from what I remember, I hadn't seen it in a long time. But the whole shop is, like, dusty and dingy. And, like, it was really gross so that's what like you said they paint us in such a poor light (laughs) yeah in that episode they had this guy in his taxidermy shop and it was dark it was like gloomy and then all the work was just you know some of the yeah some of the worst (laughs) taxidermy pieces you've ever seen and then it just the guy was a total weirdo total creep super morbid yeah and I just didn't appreciate the way they uh, painted that because Another thing, I've had more than a few people, like more than one or two people reference that episode. When I tell them that I do taxidermy, they're like, oh, have you seen that Criminal Minds episode? (laughs) Yeah, of course. Like, no wonder that people think we're all weirdos. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So like, you know, there's that, there's that whole episode. And then I don't know if they got the inspiration from that, like actual real life serial killer, Ed Gein or not. He has kind of I don't know. It's kind of somewhat of a story like that. You know, this, this guy took the eyes out of, I guess his bad customers. Yeah. (laughs) But Ed Gein has like his own story that also has been closely related with taxidermy. Ashley, if you want to tell everybody about that. Yeah. So for anyone who doesn't know Ed Gein, here is a little story for you. Back around the year 1957, a woman who owned a hardware store went missing. People had seen her and Gein together shortly before she disappeared. The police decided to go to his farm to check things out and see if maybe he had any insight on where she might be. They ended up stumbling upon her body. She Mm -hmm. had been shot and her head was missing. Well, I mean, that's not really anything shocking for killers. You know, that's what killers do. They do weird stuff like that. So, like, what, where does the taxidermy, I guess, come in? True. And, well, yes and no. Here's where the weird stuff and the, quote, taxidermy comes into play. They entered his home and found out that he had been robbing graves and stealing body parts. What did he use those body parts for? He made household items, clothing, and masks. That's that. I really don't have a comment for that. (laughs) I can only imagine what that had to look like. 
Well, they also found another woman's head that had also been missing. Turns out he had a rough childhood and had a super weird connection with his mom who passed away. So he would kill these women who reminded him of his mom. Gosh, geez. So like, would you say that taking the skin and making clothes and household items would like even count as taxidermy? I don't. I think it's more of like taxidermy adjacent, but it is True. utilizing skin and utilizing it in purposes that aren't, you know, in a typical fashion. So in my opinion, it's taxidermy adjacent. Yeah, I guess that's a good term, um, you know, because you're like still preserving something, but you're not really mounting it on anything unless I guess depending on what type of household items and stuff he was doing yeah that's yeah, a was, that's a gray area <laughs> he was doing arts and crafts <laughs> <laughs> human skin arts and crafts <laughs> yeah so people think of him as quote taxidermist but you know truly it's not really but when people think of it th think of Ed Gein they think of taxidermy which yeah I don't know so speaking of making clothes and other household items out of skin, did you know about the lion suit in The Wizard of Oz? So yeah, like wasn't it an actual African lion skin? Yeah, I don't know the specifics about it, but I do know that a lot of it was actual skin from actual lions. Maybe multiple lions, maybe a singular lion, I'm not sure, but he was wearing real lion skin. Wow, that is pretty crazy. So I actually was looking up pictures of it, you know, to refresh my mind for this episode. And I found out that it was sold at an auction house in Manhattan back in 2014. And I don't know, you may have already heard this, but do you have any guess what it sold for? Do I have any guesses what it sold for? Uh, so I imagine it went for a pretty penny. The Wizard of Oz, obviously, it's a super popular movie. Um. I'm going to say 100000 I don't know. What's it worth? So it actually sold for $3.1 Oh, wow. I was way higher. <laughs> you were just a little low. I don't know the value of things. <laughs> yeah, no, it sold, it sold oh that high. Yeah, it was insane. Um, I had found an article, actually, when they were talking about it. There were actually two suits. And the other one that I guess they kind of used it wasn't used as much as a, as the other one. Maybe it wasn't even made of real lion skin. I'm not sure. Um, it doesn't give me that info, but it does say that that one sold for 1 million. So I'm not sure why, you know, why there was a difference between 3.1 million and 1 million for the two different suits. But it was, I mean, the movie, I didn't even realize that movie was made back in 1939. Yeah. That's like a really old movie, isn't it? Well, I don't know if part of it's in black and white because of the production timing or if that was just part of the movie but I've yeah I always thought that was kind of weird <laughs> anyway yeah it's a super old movie I actually haven't seen the whole thing through I just obviously I know what it's about and I've seen parts of it but I actually haven't like watched down and sat the whole movie you've never watched the whole movie no I think I just never never really piqued my interest but now I want to see the whole movie because I want to look for this lion suit yeah I mean it's I guess I never really realized that it was real until I think you had actually told me a little while ago and then I looked up the pictures and you can see where like the main was and it's held up remarkably well. Like there's not really rub marks, you know, where the creases are from where he has been moving and stuff. Pretty impressive. I, I really wish I could find info on where the lion was taken. Like how did they get this lion skin? That would be interesting. They, uh, yeah, I saw like a video or something on it that said the lion suit was made of real lions and just a quick like you know reference here I listened to this really good podcast from the morbid podcast and they talked about the wizard of oz and like all kinds of crazy like you know morbid circumstances with the costumes and like how the tin man you know he got sick from aluminum poisoning all mm -hmm. kinds of crazy uh you know things that the actors endured during that movie and then one of the guys is wearing like a real lion suit. So it just there is a lot of crazy things around the Wizard of Oz. And, you know, it's again, taxidermy adjacent. There's another thing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's almost like if it would have had a face on it, it I would consider it taxidermy. Right. But there was no face. <laughs> yeah. Just like tanned pieces of hair on leather, basically. Yes. 
Yeah, pretty much. But yeah, I agree. There was a lot of weird stuff that went on with that movie in general, let alone just the like, that's what almost makes me wonder, was there some weird, crazy story about this lion? Like, as all the weird stuff that happened, was there some weird hunt where this lion was taken? Was it from a zoo? Like, there was pretty much, I think, no regulations back in those days. Right. There might be more to that. So we'll have to put down, like, as a note to maybe look more into this and maybe we can update y'all on what we find. Because that's, it's so fascinating. And yeah. what a weird time, like in movie history and just in history in general, like you said, because there wasn't as many regulations on animals. So it could be super interesting. Yeah, it definitely uh, doesn't hold up to modern times, I think. No, not at all. You could never, I don't think, make a lion suit. No, I don't think I, so. <laughs> you can, it's, can't even get your lions back from Africa unless you know a guy. So, <laughs> right. Yeah. Even that's complicated anymore. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, uh. So kind of on from The Wizard of Oz, I kind of wanted to take a little look back on the Ed Gein topic we were talking about, because this kind of goes into pop culture in the next discussion. Ed was the inspiration for the book Psycho, which I've never read. I think I've seen the movie American Psycho, but it in turn inspired the TV show Bates Motel. I was hooked on that show for a little while and he had a super weird thing going on with his mom too, which I think is where they got the, like the Ed Gein mom attachment mom problems plus the kind of taxidermy idea he was a taxidermist in the show Bates Motel and he didn't really seem to like do anything weird with it though he mainly mounted like birds it when I looked it up it said that it was more of an interest to take up his free time which when he wasn't having free time he was stalking people and killing them so <laughs> so that again kind of adds like a whole darkness theme yeah, to it. like the taxidermy adds the darkness to his whole character, right? Yeah, yeah. I think it's it seems like when they want somebody to seem really evil, they just make them a taxidermist. And then people think they're like, you know, it, as soon as you introduce taxidermy into a movie or something, it's just portrayed so dark and twisted. Right. Like it's never really, you know, typically it's not painted in a very positive tone or a very doesn't really represent taxidermists at least not who we are you know no. well, I mean look at the Netflix documentary on Jeffrey Dahmer that came out recently they showed him like I think as a kid or as an adult or whatever he was pulling the guts out as he was skinning the animal and I kept thinking as I'm watching this like why you know that has nothing to do with taxidermy he wouldn't be doing that in any kind of traditional taxidermy sense they're just making it seem more gory more morbid and you know, again, Jeffrey Dahmer, he was a serial killer. They're making it his whole persona. They're painting this picture and he did taxidermy in his free time too. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, he did. I think he dabbled in taxidermy when he was younger. Cause like, I remember seeing he'd pick up road kills and, and stuff like that. But I don't, I'm not even sure if he mounted this stuff. I know what his thing was, is like you said, he was pulling the guts out because he liked seeing what the guts looked like. He liked the sheen of them or something. But then you're correct because you were talking about like, if I skin an animal, I don't ever see its guts. Like it's right. <laughs> like people you have, don't get into the guts. No, yeah. no. For hope, like unless something's gut shot, which gosh, I hate that. But if you don't see the guts. It's really not that bloody. You get into certain parts where you end up, you know, having a little bit of blood. But when people actually see it in real life, they're like, oh, that's not that bad. Like, I thought it was going to be a lot worse. And it's because of shows like that, where they're like, if you talk about Jeffrey Dahmer, most people are going to say like, oh, yeah, didn't he do like taxidermy as a kid? <sighs> Maybe he did. You're right. I don't think he did. <laughs> I want to say he did like actually taxidermy some squirrels. Okay. Truly did taxidermy. He wasn't just a animal manipulator but I do know like you're saying he had some kind of weird thing with the guts like and that was his angle and he liked dissecting things and yeah that's kind of you know like we're saying taxidermy kind of does that but we don't get into the guts we only are you know involved in the skin and it truly can be a really clean process what we do and so just them showing that gutting like the scene he's there has the guts in his hands it really grinds my gears how it's like oh that's not taxidermy man 
Uh, yeah, yeah, I know. They definitely had to add some stuff like that in which, like you said, and, and that is what he did. That's what he liked. It just paints us in such a bad light. Like, I feel like once people see us as taxidermists in real life, they're like, oh, like, so for a, a little story about that is <laughs> there was a kid that came into my shop the first time that did some woodworking for me. And he literally thought, one, he thought I was going to be a big burly man, like a big, uh, like, yeah. he didn't expect a woman and he definitely didn't expect like kind of a normal, at least what I consider normal. Person. I think you're pretty normal. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, he's like, then once he heard that I was a woman, he figured I was like, he was going to walk in there and I was going to be in like a red flannel and have my hair chopped off and be like this manly, rough woman type of deal. And, yeah. uh, you know, it's just people get some weird pictures painted for taxidermists in their mind. Yeah. And then movies and TV shows like that certainly don't help. Like that kid, you know, if he didn't know you, he walks in and, oh, where's the taxidermist at? Yeah. Right here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. It's me. <laughs> I hate to keep bringing it back, but man, that Jeffrey Dahmer documentary, it, like another thing later in the episode, the mom or Jeffrey Dahmer's mom was telling his dad, like, you should have never let him get into taxidermy as if that was his issue you know that guy had a lot of issues and taxidermy was not one of them amen and you yeah. know what I half wonder since you said that like has any legitimate taxidermist ever turned out to be a serial killer that's a good question like anybody who actually does the art of taxidermy not yeah. just skin something out one time yeah yeah like if a full-time taxidermist has ever ended up being a serial I don't know about serial killer I could see maybe like killed a person or two but i don't know about a serial killed killer. a customer who critiques your eyes <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah how do you like them eyes now buddy yeah they're your <laughs> eyes um but so on another note sometimes taxidermy is added into movies and shows to add like a little bit of comedy you know they'll use something that's either really ugly or they'll just put it into a certain aspect and paint a picture of uh funniness with it so the first one that comes to my mind is a scene in Ace Ventura where this rich aristocratic guy wants to show him this room. He's like, figured, you know, from one animal lover to another, you'd really enjoy this. And of course, Ace Ventura being like a pro animal, not killing them, set them free type of guy, saw this trophy room and he just freaks out in typical Jim Carrey fashion. Just, I don't even know how to explain it. You're going to have to watch the video. <laughs> uh, and he asks him if anything's wrong. And Jim Carrey stops and he's like, of course not. This is a lovely room of death. And then he just leaves. <laughs> so it's still kind of dark because he's just calling it a room of death, but it's, it's humorous. Yeah. So that, that paints a little better of a picture than like, it's not, you know, a serial killer or anything like that. So it's just kind of like a funny humor is kind of a dark humor yeah. kind of situation. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Cause the dark humor is of course being like this man kills animals and hangs them on his wall type of deal but to be honest it's not wrong <laughs> yeah and then so what ace ventura says this is a lovely room of death and that's not really fair because yeah yeah like you know yeah it is but no it's not yeah no so. like yeah they all have to be dead but i know for me for instance i would rather see an animal that's pretty be preserved than have it thrown in a ditch like right you know it dies of natural causes in the woods, rots away, no, just goes back to the earth. I don't know. I like preserving that. I guess that's why I'm a taxidermist. <laughs> right. Same here. We all know animals have to die eventually. And here we are to immortalize them and honor them. So yeah, yeah it's, you know, it, it's an unfortunate happenstance, but may as well make something beautiful out of it, of course. There's another instance. I don't know if you've ever seen the TV show Scrubs. Yeah, I have, but I do not remember this dog. <laughs> I I don't quite remember it, but it's this dog named Rowdy. And throughout the series or, you know, whatever, they have this dog that they would put in random places and blame mischief on the dog, you know? Oh. Like, so that was, they would like use this taxidermy dog and uh, kind of like play with it a little bit. It was kind of weird, but it wasn't like, super morbid or anything was it an actual mounted dog or is it like a fake 
to look like a mounted dog. In the so in the uh, series, it's supposed to be real. I don't know if it was actually real, but like they portrayed it as if it was an actual taxidermy dog. Okay. Okay. So that as far as kinda, I know, yeah. Yeah, that'd be kind of interesting to see if it was. Actual From dog. what I remember, it looked real, and from pictures I've seen, I think so. Yeah. But huh. of course, it's hard to tell. Maybe they just found it in some like I could see the way that show is. They just found it in some taxidermy auction house and they're like we're buying this and putting this in the show somehow <laughs> and yeah that's how maybe it ended so. up. <laughs> i know so that's uh that's just another circumstance that i can think of is like taxidermy in a tv show and it wasn't like a you know it's kind of funny positive way just so yeah. random but... yeah yeah it's, and that's whole other thing is you know taxidermy pets that's maybe an episode some other day but uh i wouldn't doubt that somebody got their dog mounted and maybe passed away and the family was like I don't want it in my house yeah that could be like it's a real taxidermy dog out there somewhere and then they just happen to use it yeah that's a good question like where did it come from if it was real for this tv show yeah if we find this info we will definitely post it on social media I might have to search like yeah add that to the list Maybe that was actually the dog's real name if it was real. Maybe its name was Rowdy. And like I said, they just saw it and they're like, we're going to tie this into the show one way or another. <laughs> yeah. And they, they did. It would like pop up in random episodes, I think. So yeah, it's just kind of a, a side character. I'm going to have to look that up because I definitely do not remember a dog in that show. I loved that show because I remember that one actor. Oh, gosh, I do not remember his name. But I remember him in Wild Hogs. Have you ever watched Wild Hogs? I think I have, but I can't picture it at the okay. time. Which he's the he's the doctor in there that's like real goofy. He's like a real fast talking guy, and he's got that curly curly hair on top. And in Wild Hogs, he's a police officer, and like keeps hitting on the wild hogs and stuff. I yes. always loved him in Scrubs. He was he's just a funny actor. So I know who you're talking about. I can't picture the wild hog things, but I can picture him in Scrubs and yes. how like quirky he is. Yes, quirky is a good word. Yeah, that is a very good word for it. Uh, so to kind of stay on the whole dog topic, uh, since you brought up Rowdy, what about 101 Dalmatians and Cruella de Vil? Like, where was she going to take all these puppies that she was going to kill and make a fur coat out of? That's a really good point. So yeah, I had this epiphany the other day like wait a minute is she taking these to a tannery like where is she planning to take all these puppies so of course everyone knows the story of 101 dalmatians and cruel deville she's this evil lady who's trying to kidnap these puppies and turn them into fur coats and we know in order to do that you have to tan the skin you have to preserve them somehow so what the heck's going on so when i looked this up in the book apparently she was married to a furrier like a okay. guy who handles furs and buys, sells furs. Yeah. So that made sense. You know, he's probably doing the dirty work, right? But in the movie, they don't touch on that. And maybe they just don't say anything about it. But that was kind of the idea. So in the movie, she's just going to, you know, wing it, I guess. Apparently. I remember in one of the Dalmatian movies, and I'm not sure which number it was. I remember they were in, it was some sort of warehouse. And I don't know if it was supposed to be a tannery. To me, it didn't look like a tannery. I think they just used the warehouse and had like a bunch of big vats of stuff sitting around. And she had like two henchmen with her and stuff. But yeah, it never even brought up that she was married that I remember in the movies. A good question. Like you said, if she was going to like, was she going to skin the puppies? Was she going to like have somebody else skin? If this was real life, would a tannery take like 101 puppies <laughs> right like where is she getting these things you know tanned and preserved at I want to I want to know some of like the backstory going on here yeah I would just be curious I mean I guess if somebody's gonna most places I feel like if you're gonna bring them something like they're not gonna ask questions they're just gonna charge you for it and that'll be it so I'm sure she could have found a tannery that would have tanned her puppies for her Maybe. Was she tanning them herself? Was Corella DeVille a tanner or even a taxidermist? Like, oh, that is a I good question. That is a good question. Now I'm going to have to watch these movies over and kind of like think of this in my head. I don't You'll know. Have to speculate as you're watching it. Yeah, I don't know if I could see her skinning stuff. I feel like she had everybody else do her dirty work. That's a good point. She had like henchmen. She had yeah. a, in the book, apparently a husband. Yeah. I didn't even know there was a book of 101 Dalmatians. <laughs> I did not know that either until 
I was doing some research on this topic. So, cause I was curious, I was like, wait a minute, where does this all tie into, where is she tanning these things at? I got it. Yeah. Know. Yeah. Yeah. And like, I remember in the movie too, that she got mad because she was going to use like newborn puppies and she got mad because they don't have spots because Dalmatians like don't form their spots till I don't even know how many weeks. That's right. So the idea behind her wanting puppies was that the puppies have really soft fur mm. and then a big dog obviously has more coarse fur. So she needed very young puppies and like you're saying, didn't have spots. So then she's, you know, obviously didn't know her animal facts, didn't know her dog. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, for Pete's sakes, lady, just get a like mink coat or something. <laughs> like, you can't get right. much softer. I, I don't know what what her uh, desire to have Dalmatian puppies. Yeah, yeah, that was very strange, and uh, just like the Dalmatians not forming their spots. A little side note, because I know you have like a healer dog. I didn't realize they weren't born like the color that they are. Like, uh, yeah, healers. I don't know if you knew this, but they're actually you know they're all kinds of different breeds mixed together and one of the breeds that they are is Dalmatian. Oh. So they were mixed with like Dalmatian and like a, a some kind of Kelpie, you know, ranch dog, whatever. And then apparently oh. some Dingo, you know, wild Dingo. But one of their breeds attributes to them is Dalmatian. Huh. I did not know that. I guess that makes sense now why they don't develop their color. I remember seeing a litter that was born and I think they were all white. I'm like, those don't look like healers. They were the, they were blue healers. You ever heard that thing where Dalmatians can be kind of mean? Maybe yes. that's where healers get their meanness from is maybe salvation traits. Cause man, my little healer dog, she can be a little, you know, <laughs> B-I-T-C-H, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah. That might be, they got it from there and maybe some wild dingo on the, on the yeah, back true. side. <laughs> yeah. That's the Dalmatian thing. So that kind of ties into the taxidermy that has been seen in fashion. While some of the items aren't exactly taxidermy, it still brings it into the light and can change the opinion of the public. Yeah, I agree. Some of them are really beautiful. Like this composition that I sent you, um, it's by, I might butcher this name, Manish Aurora, maybe? Um, a fashion designer who creates wearable works of art using all sorts of different methods. Like it's not just taxidermy. He'll use like embroidery or I don't, I don't know, sculpting, like anything is on the plate for him to use. And uh, this one just so happened to have a little bit of taxidermy added in there. And he he mounted a bunch of I am not a bird taxidermist, so I might get, they almost look like parakeets, maybe? Yeah, I think you're right. Some kind of little, like, something you'd see, like a pet bird, right? Yeah, yeah, they look like something like that. And I imagine he'd want to use something pretty easily accessible. I doubt he had a lot of hookups. But it was actually, like, you know, it was pretty. It wasn't, the birds are, you know, of course, a little rough, but it was actually taxidermy. Like they had to be mounted to be put onto this dress. Yeah, it looks like it was done tastefully. Like that is very pretty. That's very like artistic. And, you know, I would say that's like honoring the life of those birds. They're using it for something beautiful. Yeah, I agree. It was not like he completely butchered it. Like this one other picture I sent you. I don't even know. I'm not even, I see a, a fox. And then I'd see some animal that I'm not quite sure might be a rabbit, maybe. They kind of just like mounted ish. They it looks like they just stuffed them. It looks more like they were just stuffed and like thrown around her neck. Yeah, I want to say that's like a fox or a coyote bunny rabbit. Yeah, and then I, I think know. I see a dead bird leg sticking up behind her shoulder somewhere. That that one gets a little weird. That one gets a little fantasy taxidermy. I think. <laughs> yeah, I'd probably title that one a little rogue. Yeah, it's like a rogue taxidermy situation. You know, some fashion isn't too bad. There was that one that Kylie Jenner, she just wore a dress recently. And it, that one was kind of, you know, ironically an anti-taxidermy dress being that it was like faux, but it was really well done. So maybe it wasn't totally anti, but it was kind of cool. It's like anybody would say that's taxidermy. I think the guy who did that is, oh man, I, I think it's just called Animal Replicas and he's on Instagram and I saw another... I'm bad with my celebrities. It was either Kylie Jenner or it was like another person in this fashion show had a snow leopard and it was like the face of a snow leopard and then like the spots. And this guy who does these animal replicas, he does a fantastic job. He's done some mounts that I've like, I don't know if you call it taxidermy because it's not skin, but he's taking fabric and laying it over these things. I'm assuming he gets forms from a taxidermy supply company and then 
mounts the skin if you want to call it mounting on this form and then he has to paint the fake fur and trim it to like match the animal it's pretty neat so this guy he's basically just making replica taxidermy right yeah yeah he just gets fake fur from somewhere and puts these things together and it's they're really nice mostly cats you know like lions leopards i've snow leopards and he makes like head like just like head mounts that just stick on your wall but they really look nice i don't even know where he's from they do look really realistic like they look kind of legit and there was quite a few of them at this what paris fashion week wherever kylie jenner was at whenever this happened where she was wearing the lion on herself there was a couple other ones like there was a what is it like a wolf yeah that's my guess it looks pretty cool i mean the wolf face is kind of freaky looking in that picture but um yeah like they look neat even though i hate saying that in a way because like you said it's almost more of like an anti-taxidermy yeah, show it's all faux, but it is i mean that is cool that they are like because there is really good taxidermy replicas but then i think their angle might have been a little bit like vegan you know yeah. like that was maybe their angle for having faux taxidermy on them it said Jenner's look was one of a series of faux fur garments designed by Daniel Roseberry. Oh. So that's the creator. Interesting. But So it's cool. It's pretty. And, you know, maybe in a way it does, you know, promote taxidermy in a way. Yeah, I guess. I mean, if people see it and don't realize that it's not real taxidermy. Right. It still kind of, like you said, promotes it. But so since we're speaking of dresses in that whole fashion world topic, do you remember the meat dress that Lady Gaga wore to the MTV Video Music Awards? Ah, uh, yeah. How could I forget? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was kind of hard to forget. So like, do not get me wrong. That dress was not taxidermy. The dress itself was not, period. But right. in my research about taxidermy in fashion, I came across this interesting story that I never heard of. And to be honest, I'm not sure if I'd consider what was done as being taxidermy, but it did involve a taxidermist. So what had happened is the the people who, I don't know if it was the guy who made the dress or if it was this museum that wanted to have the dress, they recruited a taxidermist from California his name was Sergio Vigaledo, something like that. <laughs> um, okay. He's from Burbank, California, and he was contacted by the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in museums two months after the singer wore the dress. So the first thing that he asked is, where is the dress? You know, did you preserve it? Is it rotten? Like, you know, what did you do with this, this, <laughs> this 35 pound dress made of a dozen thin cut flank steaks so apparently after she wore the dress they put it in a freezer and that way it was frozen no maggots and then it was delivered to that taxidermist uh, shop three and a half weeks later so after he defrosted it he found out that it had an odor like apparently while she was wearing it no surprise there it started to somewhat decompose I mean, you know, she's wearing this dress. Yeah, just her body heat alone starts to make it go, what's the word, like putrid? Yeah, I mean, like, no wonder. So this taxidermist did not want to reveal the process that he used to cure this dress. The museum paid him $6,000 up front to do this job, by the way. And that was, you know, back in, I think, 2014 or something like that. So it was a while ago. Since he didn't say how he preserved it, the museum officials kind of came out and kind of told people what had happened. He said that uh, that it was treated with bleach, formaldehyde, and detergent to remove bacteria. He's a uh, wet specimen. It like, I he's... guess you would think the better uh, route would be to just freeze dry it. Yeah, you, you think, think so? But then would that make it like really brittle? Well, it's in a museum, I guess. Oh right, I kept thinking like when she's wearing it. Oh yeah, so she. I guess it's just for it to just sit in the museum so it didn't have to be wearable so then after he treated these meat slabs however he did this he glued them to a mannequin that was outfitted with a pattern to resemble the original dress and then he had to dye it because whatever he did you know it lost its color so he dyed it and then he boxed it up to the cleveland museum so it's still in this museum 
as far as i can tell unless they like put it up somewhere um actually i just looked it up too like it happened in 2010 2010 okay yeah so it's been what 14 years almost now that this meat suit has been in existence yeah yeah like i don't i don't really consider it taxidermy because you know it wasn't no no skin but it's just kind of funny to me that they actually recruited a taxidermist to preserve it that is funny i didn't know that part of it yeah you would think you would think a butcher would be in charge of that uh yeah i or whatever i guess speaking of butcher the guy who made the dress apparently went to some local butcher shop that his family uses a whole bunch and he bought 40 pounds of beef for the dress. He only ended up using like 35 pounds of meat. And oh, so the 35 pounds of meat for the dress, it was also for a hat, shoes, and a purse. It was not just the dress. He apparently just asked the butcher's opinion on what pieces of meat, like what cuts of meat are going to hold together well. So that's what, how he ended up with flank steaks and... uh Oh, he went on that they they held together well, but they also didn't drip blood because that would, of course, you know, be a problem. Right. (laughs) And the butcher shop kind of hooked him up and it ended up being like three dollars and ninety nine cents a pound, which is pretty cheap to put together a dress. And I'm sure he charged a lot of money for this dress. Oh, my God. That I remember that meat dress, though, like that really caused a lot of controversy and people were up in arms about it. So it really made a statement whether you like it or not. Yeah. Yeah, it did. It did. I really actually wanted to talk to that taxidermist, but when I looked up his shop, it seemed really hard to get a hold of. Oh, uh, well, when you're doing work for Lady Gaga, you know, you're a busy guy. <laughs> Apparently. Oh, so here's another little interesting thing. That taxidermist apparently didn't use all of the meat for the dress. Like, I guess he didn't need it all. I don't know how that works, but he has the leftover beef in his shop freezer and he might seek permission to turn it into necklaces, bracelets, and other pieces of jewelry. That's a little odd. <laughs> like, hey, the same cow that Lady Gaga wore, you can wear part of that too. Yeah, I don't, I mean, there's definitely would be people would buy it. I ain't no doubt about that. That's true. The Lady Gaga fans, they'd be like, yeah, she wore this. This necklace was a piece of flank steak she wore <laughs> see just yeah taxidermy taxidermists they we get a, a weird reputation for a reason i guess you know there's just weird things sometimes but the way that we're painted in the public eye and pop culture can be just so like uh, misleading and misrepresenting oh, i know it is it's very misleading you know it's it's something that we end up being judged for like when you tell somebody you're a taxidermist you're gonna get either a good reaction a curious reaction or like oh <laughs> yeah it's usually the oh kind yeah. of reaction and then i know yeah. you and i we probably you know i'm sure you get this as much as i do like when you tell people you're a taxidermist like oh well i would have expected some big burly guy yep like we're exactly. not your typical taxidermists and i think the thing that like pop culture doesn't uh, represent as taxidermists like i don't think they should the kind of light on taxidermy that is true, number one. But then, like, they don't show that we are lovers of animals. Well, in Ace Venture, I guess they kind of did. But (laughs) they don't show us as, like, lovers of animals. Like, we think animals are beautiful. We want to, like, honor them and memorialize them. That we're doing it to make art. And we're artists. Like, you don't see that side of taxidermy really in any kind of pop culture reference. Yeah, so this is one I honestly didn't think about until you just brought that up. They had had that TV show called Immortalized, and that was um, about taxidermy. It was like a taxidermy challenge. Have you ever seen it? I don't believe I have, no. it. I don't remember what years. It was somewhere in like the mid, you know, between 2010 and maybe 2015, 16, something like that. They would get like artists, like these half of them were taxidermists and half of them were just artists and then they'd give them a challenge to recreate something and then they'd see who came up with the better piece the taxidermist or the the artist that was still even kind of painted in like a kind of dark like theme like it was very roguey even though all the taxidermists they had Mm -hmm. weren't rogue taxidermists it was very a very rogue vibe that they had going on and then they only gave you I think like I don't know a month maybe it's either a week or a month to like create your thing and what 
piece of taxidermy is going to be like slamming in a week, you know? So it was just kind of a grim depiction of taxidermy. It wasn't like how we do taxidermy, not a typical taxidermy situation. Yeah. Yeah. You got a little bit, I guess, in there and depending on the taxidermist they had, cause they had, I think I'm definitely going to be wrong. Cause I, I have no clue, but I think it was like maybe five, five taxidermists and then five other competitors. And then they'd, you know, they'd make their pieces and they bring them in in front of the judges and unveil them each separate. And then the judges would vote on their favorite one. And the person who they didn't like, I think, then got eliminated. Oh, so and what was this called? Like immortalized? Um, or? Yeah, immortalized huh. or immortalizers. It was one of those two. Interesting. I've never really heard of that, I don't think. But yeah, yeah that what an interesting type of challenge that you would have people that aren't taxidermists and were they doing taxidermy? Like that was the challenge? The taxidermists had to do their part of taxidermy. And the other people, I think, could use whatever art medium they wanted. Oh, I see. Okay. And I think some of them, some of the not taxidermists were like rogue-ish taxidermists. So like some of their stuff would include like taxidermy, but it was like that rogue stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. But then I guess, you know, if we think about TV shows about taxidermy, there was also Mountain in Alaska. That was kind of like legit. Right. That one, obviously, it was, it involved the studio by it Russell involved, Knight. Yeah. Russell Knight. He's the owner of the studio up there and it showcased their day to day stuff in the shop. I had never actually seen that, but I've just heard so many things about it. That was obviously something that painted taxidermy in a good light. Yeah. Yeah. There was that. And then there was, there was one that was in the middle. And I don't remember what it was called, but I know the shop name was Extreme Taxidermy, and I think it was in Arkansas. Have you ever seen that? Was it called American Stuffers? Yeah, that might have been it. That might have been it. It's I've where never... they mounted pets. Oh, I haven't seen that one either, but let's pause for just a second. We'll look okay. it up. Okay, so yeah, this American Stuffers was an American reality show, and they, yep, you're right. It's called Extreme Taxidermy. And they're preserving the pets of the customers that come into the store and, you know, perhaps some other stuff too. But I wonder how that one, you know, the perception of that one. Had you ever seen that show? Yeah, I used to watch that a lot because that was, I think, out when I was in maybe middle school, high school, something like that. And, you know, when I was interested in taxidermy, but not yet a taxidermist. And I thought it was entertaining. You know, their their shop was kind of a small shop and it was, you know, it wasn't some big fancy shop, but I feel like it posts like it gave you a realistic view of a taxidermy shop. Yeah, that's the thing. Like when you talk about a realistic perception of a taxidermist, I think, you know, when you get like random movies and TV shows, it represents it kind of funny. But then when you get stuff like reality shows, like we're talking the mountain in Alaska, American stuffers, those are reality shows. So the reality of taxidermy is that it's you know, a lot different than how it's perceived in movies and TV shows, that kind of thing, fiction stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't see that ever changing. You know, it's fine. There's always going to be people that think that we're weird for doing what we do. And they're always going to use it to kind of portray that. And then another one, that stuffed documentary, that one was really, you know, about the day in and day out of taxidermists. It had, uh, it followed people around to the world show it had our friend daniel mang on there and he was part of the stuff documentary like there was some other facets that they had and that was all realistic stuff so that was kind of cool it showed a lot of the art of taxidermy but it obviously was very realistic hmm. yeah i'll have to check that out i keep wanting to watch it and i just haven't watched it yet yeah it's good it paints taxidermy in a pretty like favorable way so i like it good good it's about darn time <laughs> Right. Yeah. I think, I mean, I was kind of surprised because it did seem like it could have been a little bit like fairy tale taxidermy, but really it was super uh, like favorable to taxidermists. It had little pieces about hunting. Yeah. Good. I know that, I know Daniel has told me from like the behind the scenes side of it, you know, he's told me about, you know, it was in Africa and they really were kind of all over the place, like all over the country and then in Africa and other countries, like there was a whole lot of crazy backstory to that. So I really do need to watch it because I've heard all like the juicy details of behind the scenes. So like, I want to see who these people are. 
I thought it was really good, obviously, but I think it really focused a lot on like museum taxidermists and more like, you know, kind of art side of taxidermy, which is totally fine. Like I loved that. It and it had some pieces about hunting, but not not enough, in my opinion. Maybe that's my bias, but I in my opinion, the stuff documentary didn't share enough about where the animals came from or the, you know the majority of animals that we taxidermy come from hunting so it was so good and it like painted a beautiful picture of taxidermists but I would have liked to see more about hunting in it it's my personal opinion yeah that makes sense that's a valid point I know I've had like my friends tell me often that we should make a YouTube at the shop I work at as like a reality thing. And I'm like, no, I think that's why you can't like museum taxidermy. You're not talking about people's mounts that they bring in, you know, like somebody brings in something that's really rough. You don't really want that to be on what you're talking about. <laughs> you don't yeah. want that to be like out there for everybody to see. So that's maybe where it gets kind of tough. Like you're going to need, if you want to create a realistic thing, it's going to have to be like Knight's taxidermy, kind of the mountain in Alaska. And you really got to have all your people on board to make sure it'd be a lot of editing. That's all I know. Yeah, it would be a lot of editing of what people say. Yeah. And then yeah. maybe like it would be a lot. I think that about probably wraps it up for today. Um, I'm sure a few of our listeners learned a few things. Uh, we took a lot of crazy turns through this episode. And I honestly, I couldn't wait to talk about some of this stuff with you. I was super excited. <laughs> Yeah, we had a lot of uh, fun conversations throughout this. And heck, I learned some crazy things too. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. We'd like to thank our listeners for tuning into our new podcast, Wild Verse. We hope you enjoyed stories from taxidermy and pop culture, and we would love to hear your opinions on some of the topics we covered. If you would like to stay up to date on new episode releases, you can follow us on Facebook at Wild Verse Taxidermy Podcast and Instagram at Wild Verse Podcast. Wild Verse, just so you guys know, is spelled W-I-L-D-V-E-R-S-E. -E. Check us out on those. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Wild Verse Podcast, to see when new videos come out. Or you can check out Wild Verse on podbean.com to listen from your favorite apps. We hope you have a great week. And just remember, not all taxidermists are serial killers. Not all of us. <laughs>